Good morning, fellow humanists. My name is Todd Kimball. I'll be your MC today, and this will be my shortest opening ever, a little bit different meeting today. Our presenter is has to leave at 11 Pacific time today. He's also dealing with a COVID diagnosis, but we talked to him early in the meeting. He's sounding great, and you are going to love this presentation. We're going to start with a podcast, which will be the basis of a question and answer period. So let me read just a very quick introduction of our speaker, and I will turn it over to Mark Blythe. Mark is a Scottish American political economist, currently the William R. Rhodes Professor of International Economics and professional of, Professor of International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Mark, thank you for being here. Take it away. All right. I love short introductions. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, thanks everyone for showing up today. Um, there's even more. I see I'm, I'm the co-host, so I can admit people as well. This is great. Um, this came about because one of your number, Dell, listened to this NPR interview that I did and was quite struck with it and said, you should come and talk to our group. And I couldn't think of any reason why I would say no. So I said, okay. But then I thought it'd be interesting not to come and actually give a talk. I do that all the time. I could put up slides and all this sort of stuff and we could have a chat. But at the same time, why make it less of a, of, a, of a less of a conversation in a sense? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to play you this podcast, which lasts for about 15 minutes. And then after that, I'm just going to say, OK, so what does that make you think of? And then if you want to ask me questions or talk amongst yourselves or whatever, we will work the rest of the hour that way. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to start playing it now. So there, that seemed to capture the moment. I got a lot of mail from people saying, wow, that was amazing. And you can't believe how many times I've went, ah, when I'm <laughs> you know, it, it seems to strike a note. So that's that. So what do you want to talk about? Okay, uh, that was uh, very insightful, very informative. I'll start with the first question. Uh, get things so a two-part question for you, Mark, but they're quick parts. If I were to make you the global economist in charge of, making the world better how long would i need to put you in place for this position and what would you do to uh make make the world better for us we we need you mark <laughs> well first of all if i'm everyone's last great hope it's already too late so let's just start there <laughs> um i don't think it's a very good idea to have one person in charge if you have a look at what's happening in russia it pretty much tells you that's pretty much a bad idea but, you know, what we, what we collectively need to do is pretty straightforward, but it's also very difficult to, to actionize. Let me give you an example again from this notion of West Virginia that I was talking about in the podcast. So here's a way of thinking about American politics you'll never see in the press, but I think it really works. Imagine you start off in Alaska, you come down through the Dakotas, and you uh, go to Oklahoma, you turn left to East Texas, you go right through Texas, you go to Louisiana, you spin around, you come up through West Virginia. You've got not just the ab absolute core of the Republican coalition in those states. The basic business model of each of those states is the exploration, excavation, transformation, and otherwise usage of carbon and its derivatives. That's what they do. And if you're on the coasts, you want electricity, you want to ban SUVs, you want to have um, all your green stuff, which is basically a mortal threat to the business model of these states, of your fellow citizens. Now, the way that we figure this out, the IRA, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, which actually has very little to do with inflation, it was passed recently, it's, it's quite fascinating because what it does is it provides in the form of tax credits, bottomless margaritas, bottomless mimosas of tax credits for anybody who's investing in green stuff. If you go to a, a coal mine and shut down the coal mine and then turn it into a carbon capture and storage place, the government will undercut, underwrite 50% of your cost of your capital. If you employ local labor, they'll underwrite another 10%. You can get up to 75% of your cost covered through these investments. This is why there's a really interesting schism in here because another part of the Republican coalition I didn't mention is the state of Georgia. And Georgia doesn't do carbon. In fact, Georgia is just as Republican as everywhere else, but their business model is more diverse. 
As a consequence, they're a very entrepreneurial governor. Is the guy who's saying, give me all these IRA subsidies. There's eight electric battery factories going up in Georgia. There's about 12 other multi-billion dollar projects. So they're taking the money because they know that's where the money is. Now, the question is, how quickly can we basically, in a sense, bribe the Republican areas to accept these new investments and therefore decarbonize? Because the only way you're going to get it, the only way you're ever going to get the transformation is not through trust through blue and red, but basically through people in the red states going, this is where my money, go this is how I'll make money in the future. So you have to basically do all your green investment in the Republican states. And guess what? That's actually what's happening. You don't put up windmills in blue states. You put them up in Texas. So I think we're getting there. And we're, the IRA is the beginning of like how you see you're going to manage your set of problems. Everybody's going to have a version of this. China's already halfway there. Sounds good. Our Friendly House audience is dominating the questions uh, at this point. Let's go to Richard at the Friendly House with the first question. Uh, yes, well, thank you for a, uh, for a, for a very interesting talk, um, even if it was a year old or so. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, you, you seem to paint the, the, the situation in the U.S. as a sort of a red state, blue state uh, a schism that, that's causing a lot of the problem. But, but surely on a global scale, that's not the, uh, that's not the major concern. And so the, the question uh, would be uh, on a, in, in the global economy, what can be done to – can anything be done to, other than ending the war in the Ukraine, which would, which would help things a lot? Yeah. Um, is there anything that can be done to try to uh, to try to uh, alleviate global warming and to uh, and to to make the world a better place? So, thanks for the question. Um, no, I don't think there is. I think that the whole global thing's massively overdone. And here's an example as to why. Finish this sentence for me. The carbon footprint of your average Nigerian is equivalent to the average American. What? Have a guess. The average American fridge. We, we don't need international agreements. The, their output is so small. It's absurd. We are the problem, right? We, we, are, we are a third of global consumption. <laughs> this is, we need to clean our act up. It's all about what we do here. It's really it's three countries. It's essentially India, who have got every incentive to decarbonize because they have no oil. And solar, solar and wind gives them energy independence. China, who know damn well that they got rich by basically having a kind of comparative advantage in labor costs and pooping into their own environment. They now need to clean up that environment. That's why every year China installs more solar than the rest of the world has. And then there's us. And if you get those three countries going, you're almost two thirds of the way there. If you throw the EU on top of that, that's it. So you don't really need the agreement of 100, 100 German princes, right, to quote Immanuel Kant, right? You don't need all that. You just basically need three or four places to get their shit together. And that's all domestic politics. Yeah. Let's go to Joyce at the Friendly House. Thank you, Mark. Hi, Joyce. Hi. <laughs> um, you're talking, we need a radical change in the economy, and Biden's change is not nearly big enough. So what would that change look like considering the political situation that Biden is up against? But I would go back and think about it this way. Why is it that the politics are so polarized? And I think it comes down to the business models, right? If I was Republican sitting in a Republican state and I saw AOC waxing lyrical about the Green New Deal, I wouldn't trust it as far as I could throw her. And the reason I wouldn't trust it is because I had friends that used to live in, let's say, Flint, Michigan, or Gary, Indiana. Those used to be prosperous places with like really solid communities and really solid jobs. They really were the heartland of America. Back in 1971, you and I are old enough to remember this, one in five jobs in America was in the auto sector. And one in three jobs were in industries that fed the auto sector. We were all part of one business model. And then what happened is it got broken up, shipped abroad, downsized, outsourced, and then the money went to the coasts, to the West Coast with tech, and then to the East Coast with finance and government. And everybody else got hollowed out. 
the bits that are holding on that have their own independence, the Republican coalition, are there because they do carbon. And at the end of the day, we still need carbon. Even if you want to build a windmill, there's only one thing that can do the steel, which is coking coal. So you're never going to get rid of it. You just need to reduce the amount you're using. So I think it's about recognizing that we are mutually dependent on each other. We need each other. It's not about one side winning. It's about generating um, trust that you can basically do this for both sides. And that's what the Inflation Reduction Act is actually trying to do. And that's also why the Europeans are so freaked out by it, because it might actually work. Hi, Al. Yeah. Uh, about the time you were born was when I was taking up economics. And it was a lot different then, because it was very fun. There were so many good things in economics. There was this idea of comparative advantage that said trade is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you know, since then, we've lifted a billion people worldwide out of poverty through trade. But we've all lost faith in it. Right. Is there any reason to think that the old models are any good? Or what do you offer from economics that gives us reason for optimism now? Is there, is there for example, any reason to think that it, that no matter how bad things are, almost everybody will have a comparative advantage in something and can, can therefore be happy. This kind of cooperation you talk about can work worldwide still. Well, I mean, you know, the, que the question is, you know, did it, did it ever work to the extent that we thought it worked? Right? I'll give you an example of this, right? Um, India was hoping that as, as everyone got fed up of China, and particularly Xi, because it turns out that the Communist Party are, are actually communists. Who knew, right? So they're getting a bit freaked out by China. They thought that India would get a lot of the business and a lot of jobs and everything would move there. And it hasn't happened. It just hasn't happened for them. So the question is, where did the jobs go? Right? Because clearly they're moving out of China. Where's it going? Well, they're going to Vietnam. But Vietnam's not that big. So what's actually happening is the jobs are basically disappearing. And why is that? Because what globalization tends to do is create as many kind of redundancies as it does complementarities. In a sense, you've got too much stuff in the capacity to make too much stuff in too many different places. That's one of the reasons prices were, for about 20 years, very, very low, because you were building so much stuff. China on its own, when there was the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, China stepped up with a huge stimulus program that provided 60% of global growth for, through 2013. So that one economy on its own powered us through what would have been a much worse recession. Now, when you think about it that way, you know, is there is there space, you know, when you think about comparative advantage, what exactly is Argentina's comparative advantage? Beef, other people do that. Wine, other people do that. Soybeans to sell to China, other people do that. And if you're one of those commodity countries, what happens is when China wants your soybeans, you cut down more of the Amazon, you get more soybeans, there's more demand for soybeans, and then COVID hits. Then the shipments stop, the price of soybeans crashes, and then your economy massively gets into trouble. That's what happens to Latin America all the time. So, you know, there's a question as to whether this, the sort of the happy trade story really, really happened in that way. What really happened was, you know, the billion people out of poverty, 600 million of that's China. Right. And that's because of very, very hands on state intervention in the economy. It's not comparative advantage, except that they had a ton of cheap labor. But so does India. And India never profited from that. So it's more than just a comparative advantage. Let's go to a question from the last row at the Friendly House. I like the idea of the last row. <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> does Dakota still have a question there? Yes, indeed. Go ahead. There we go. Now I can see myself. Um, I am still, I don't know if I can turn this phone. I very much, I'm still in that last row, so maybe it still counts. <laughs> but uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, there are two things, and I did a little bit of research, and I was listening to um, your stuff outside of this, and I'm a big fan, but there were two things I wanted to run by you just to yeah, sure. thoughts on. Um, so the first thing is, and it deals with the, with, with the externalities of production. There's environmental externalities and there's human externalities environmental externalities doesn't look like we're going to be able to change much necessarily at least immediately um as far as the human externalities go um in australia this is a thing america hasn't gotten to yet but in australia at least um there's a 
there's something called a Q and a, there's a Quanda. Um, and uh, I forget the name of the guy who hosted it. And some, some programs in the UK also do this. Um, there isn't such a program in the U S and I feel like there's a lot of potential for such a program to happen, but if we're facing things, especially with, uh, ecological catastrophes and just our own problems, just normally, um, and it's going to require at least fundamental change as a group. Um, what do you think? It's not, what do you think it'll change, but, um, I guess how would, would you be in, would you be, how about we start this? What's a quanda? It's a Q. It's a. It's just a. I would. I would consider it a Q and A. Um, it's okay. basically a forum for democratic deliberation and public dialogue. Um, yeah, they, they, so. these things are called mini publics. Yeah, they do them in France as well. All that sort of stuff. These things can be good. You can actually get a lot of good stuff out of them. Um, I'm actually quite quite a fan of these things. Uh, I think that like a lot of things when it comes to sort of decision making about big stuff really should be done in fora such as this. I like the idea of citizen juries, but juries not for criminal trials, for policy making. So basically you just take a hundred random people literally pulled off the tax rolls and you put them somewhere nice, like a nice hotel up in New Hampshire or something like this, and you feed them and you give them time and you buy them out of their work and all the rest of it. And you say, all right, we've got this big problem. How do you think we should fix it? And you could do it with like a group in New Hampshire and a group in Santa Monica, or whatever. And then you just come back and you take the best ideas. And then you've got something that you know isn't filled with moneyed interests. Yes. Right? Or, pop, or, or just take some community leaders from Texas and uh, yeah, like, totally. hear, hear those tears. And, and then also some from uh, California. Yeah, the yeah, second no, question, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of those things. I think they could really, really work well. Especially in the United States, or at least um, we might be in need of it. Well, it's also an opportunity for us to talk to each other again. I mean, we don't. I mean, there's a terrible thing called social media, which has turned communication into just, you're a dick, no, you're a dick. And, you know, it's not really helpful at all for any of us in any way at all. So anything that actually brings people face to face to actually talk about real issues, yeah, to be applauded. Very good. You're part of my survey. I'm sorry. Um, the second question is a, uh, it's a question about your experience and as far as what you think and I'll give an example of this, but what do you think the way we define capitalism could have? What sort of effect do you think that could have on our economy? Because I think at least especially around people my age, there's um, an incorrect perception about what it is. And uh, I think it might be um, appropriate not to give it. And, and a lot of people on the Republican side or just in general conservatives are far too eager to give it three cheers and say, yes, the market is correct or the market is justified. Um, maybe you could give it two cheers, but really all I would say capitalism is, and this is the example, is just a matter of, it's really just a reflection of our own, like if this matches what we're doing, this matches, I have this thing and you have this thing. It doesn't say something bad about capitalism that we like to own things. It's, that's us, it's a reflection of us. Um, so what do you believe that could do if we redefined capitalism for the economy as a whole? It might make that conversation easier. Do you I guess or no? Well, I mean, I don't like to get hung up on words. You know, people get, you know, I define it this way, you define it that way. I mean, you know, what is capitalism? Capitalism is basically profit-seeking businesses and firms become kind of like the base unit of how we get stuff. And networks of those firms are called markets. And you scale up from there. It's actually kind of politically neutral. I mean, China is filled with markets. The country is run by communists, right? I mean... Just because you've got markets and prices and all that stuff doesn't necessarily imply any ter- any particular political order. Um, I think the reason that your generation has like is definitely not in the three cheers cap is because your generation is on the worst end of it. Right? Basically, what happened was over the past 40 years, look around at all the people in the room with you who are basically my age or older, right? We have everything, all of it, right? We went on an unprecedented bull run through the stock markets. From, from basically 1980 until 2008. And then when it all went to shit in 2008, we got our elected like, representatives, who are all our age, to bail all that out to make sure that we didn't suffer any losses. And then to pay for that, you rack up loads of debt. And then because you've got loads of debt, you turn around and say, well, we can't do anything. We'd like to do things like invest more in education and a lot. But, you know, we can't in debt future generations. So what you do is you basically cut back all your spending now, harming those future generations. One of the reasons that your generation loves Bitcoin so much and alternative currencies is because we've got all the real currencies. This is intergenerational. You guys can't form assets. Right, basically, getting a house is really hard. 
getting a job that pays for a house if you haven't got family money, if you live in any any um, um, uh, growth city, is almost impossible. So, you know, to me, the thing is less about the, the, the how we define capitalism and much more about a kind of intergenerational contract, which is really broken down, whereby we're meant to basically solve our shit so that you don't have to deal with it. But what we're actually doing is refusing to do that and just handing it to future generations without giving them the capacity to pay for it. I'll follow up with a question as I wait for other questions, either from the <laughs> Zoom audience or the Friendly House. Uh, our Zoom audience has yet to speak up, so... Uh, Come on, uh, Zoomies! Yeah, I encourage Get our your hands up. audience with questions. Just, just um, raise, your, raise, your, raise your virtual hand. It's in the Maxins <laughs> button. Look, there it is. Everyone can do it. I can raise, <laughs> raise it and lower it. There you go. So okay. my question is, and it's a good segue uh, to what we were just talking about, uh, but I always like to talk to professors who are around young people all the time. Uh, what was, give me an example of a time when a young person really made you think or uh, reconsider one of your positions. Um, what was a good one? I mean, I've planned it. Reconsider my positions. That's an interesting, I try not, that comes into a question of personal politics. And I dryly try and keep that out of the classroom. I'm not somebody who brings that in. You know, to, to, for, you know, for them to get me to reconsider my position on the gold standard would be highly unusual, right? They need to know more about it than I do. And if they do, I shouldn't be teaching the class, right? Um, I've, met, I've met some absurdly talented students. I mean, just people who are just incredible. I'll give you one little example. When I first went to Brown, there was a guy, I shouldn't mention any names, right? But there was a, a guy who came up to me and said, hi, I, I, was, I was just doing a 20 person senior seminar. And I said, uh, I came to this class, didn't really know. I just moved from Johns Hopkins. And uh, this kid comes up to me and says, hi, I'm a senior. My name is, and I'm a triple concentrator. I'm like, ooh, what's that? And it's like kind of, we call majors concentrations, right? So it's like, I've got three majors. I'm like, well, aren't you impressive? So what are your majors? Well, I'm math, physics, and philosophy. I'm like, Ooh, very impressive, nice, nicely done. Uh, he says, yeah, I've tried to take a few econ classes, but I just can't really get into them. I think most of the math's kind of wrong for what they're trying to examine. I'm like, interesting, that's pretty good. So anyway, can I take your class? And I was like, sure. So we just did this kind of reading great books of political economy stuff. So you get to read Keynes and all that sort of stuff, right? Kayak, all of it, right? And he wrote this paper at the end. And the paper was a claim that said that Keynes's understanding of the macroeconomy was formed from his understanding of statistics, which he wrote about 10 years previously. Because of the revolution in statistics that happened at the end of the 19th century in statistical mechanics, which look at the aggregate properties of, of uh, statistical systems rather than their individual components. I had never heard this argument before. I sent it to a guy who runs a journal called the Journal of Philosophical Economics and said, have you heard this argument before? Is this kid plagiarizing this or whatever? And he looked at it and said, no, he's not plagiarizing. It's completely unique. I want to publish the paper without revisions. Wow. Yeah, that's just that level of smart. You're like, oh, shit. Yeah, they do exist. Yeah, that's that's great. I see Dell at the mic at the Friendly House. Uh, Dell, go ahead with your question. That's Dell, the legend. Hey, Dell. I'm the culprit. <laughs> you are indeed. The, you definitely look like my ideal culprit. Yeah, uh, that's good. That's good. Well, the th I just wanted to comment. I think that uh, society in general has, or whoever is responsible, has not uh, done anything to replace those jobs that have been taken over by automation. And I think a good example is in the auto industry where mm -hmm. a car body now is put together all by robots and the people that put them together when Henry Ford was building cars all had a job. Now all these people are, and the labor union requires good high wages for those people that are working. So we got a lot of people out there sitting on their duff with nothing to do. Yep, or they're working in Walmart. That's what happened. We basically moved over to a service-oriented uh, consumption economy. Yep, hundred percent. He's back. I'm back. So, um, I, I had I had two questions. One one's very short at the end. Uh, the first question is: You had mentioned in your talk that you thought that the indicators 
um, the economic indicators might mm. be giving us the wrong story. Yeah. And so I guess the question is, what indicators do you think either do exist now and are ignored or need to exist in order to get a better idea of, of what's truly happening with the economy? Sure. I'll give you a really simple example of this, right? There's an entire thing, entire industry out there called ESG scoring. You might have heard of this, Economic, Social and Governance Goals. And it's what companies have incorporated into how they think about their investments and the advertiser credentials, et cetera. Now, needless to say, this has been weaponized by the Republicans. There's now a fatwa on this stuff. They're going after it as woke capitalism, blah, 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 right? But before we immediately polarize, right, let's think about what ESG tries to do. ESG tries to estimate uh, on a, the level of the firm what the effect of climate change will be on the value of the firm. Therefore, you should adjust your portfolios and your investments to basically go with firms that are going to be like more climate acceptant in that sense, right? Now, that sounds good until you start to think about something. Okay, so that's what that measures. Shouldn't we be measuring the effect that the firm has on the climate? Shouldn't it be the exact opposite? Because if you did that, you would instantly figure out that there are 75 firms worldwide that cause 80% of global warming, and we should de-invest from them all. Now, that's the say, that's like, that metric tells you, look this way, right? If you just turn around and look at it that way, you get a completely different picture, right? I'll give you another example of this, the story we tell all the time. So all those stimulus checks that supposedly caused the inflation, it's kind of weird, because the inflation's everywhere. And we were the only people with stimulus checks. Luckily, there's actually a thing called the Survey of Consumer Finances. You can get it online. And if you go check out the June, July, August, and September 2021 Surveys of Consumer Finances, you'll find it will happen to the stimulus checks. They all went into the greatest paybacks and credit card reduction of all time. Now, if all the money you're spending is stimulus, is going into credit card reduction, it's not being stimulatory, it's paying down debt. So why then are we blaming that for causing the inflation? The answer is simple, because inflation basically broadly redistributes costs and benefits, right? If you're somebody who's on a fixed income, it can really hurt. If you're somebody that's able to basically play variable rates, right? If I'm Saudi Arabia, Inflation is a problem because I pay more for imports. But if the main culprit is oil prices, last quarter I made $115 billion. So the idea that we all lose from this stuff and we all need to clamp down on inflation is just total bullshit. So that's what I mean about the metrics, right? You know, you can look at it one way, you see someone else. And and since I have a, a bona fide e economist uh, on, the, on the other end, um, isn't crypto just like the biggest Ponzi scheme that's been invented in the last hundred years? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Very simple. <laughs> Al's back at the mic. Yeah, Al's up again. Go on, Al. Okay. Uh, you said we've got it all. I think of two things that might take it all away from us. Tell me about this. Um, what happens to the world economy when uh, the U.S. dollar ceases to be the world currency? And what happens to the world economy and the American economy when um, the United States Navy ceases to patrol the high seas because China's out building us on ships three to one and pirates take over the, all the oceans? Well, on the second one, China has no interest in pirates taking over the oceans. So I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, but the point is well taken. The dollar one is a fascinating one. Here's something to think about, right? This year, the United States is going to spend more money paying interest on the debt than it does on defense. That's a lot of money. We could be spending it on someone else. Okay, but here's the thing. Let's think about it this way. Who sets the interest on the debt? It's the Fed. Who issues the money? It's the Fed. What are we in the middle of just now? A bit of a banking crisis. Why is that? Because being worried about inflation, we pushed up interest rates. Why is that significant? Well, if you're a bank for the past 20 years, you've been encouraged to hold loads and loads of treasury bonds. And the world's filled with treasury bonds. The entire planet regards them as a savings bond. 
because there just aren't enough of other types of stuff. So 70% of all financial assets are dollars. More dollars are lent out by non-American entities outside of the United States in the form of dollar loans than are printed by the Fed. The dollar is everywhere. Now, why is this significant? Because if you start raising interest rates, the price of your bonds go down. So what that means is those bonds are losing value, which means that those banks, their hedge, their reserves are losing value. That makes people nervous. But you see, if I'm the Fed, I've got another trick for you there, Al, because when I'm paying interest on the debt, who do you think owns the bonds? Oh, it's the banks. So while they're losing money on their capital assets, they're getting money on their interest payments. What crisis? It's just a carburetor. I'm just adjusting the airflow mix. You can't get out of the dollar. There's, there's nothing else to get into. Would you hold Chinese money? Would but, you? But it's a weird thing that when, when the U.S. economy gets worse, the dollar gets stronger because all the other economies get worse when the U.S. economy gets worse and people flee to dollars. You remember the immortal philosophy of the best economist of all time, Mel Brooks. It's good to be the king. Let's go to Nada from our Zoom audience jumping in with a question. Okay, first of all, let me I'll let, you, let you know that all of this is just way over my head. Um, but recently I was talking with some people about a guaranteed income. And I was looking at some of the old experiments Mm -hmm. And um, one of them said that the government pulled it because the people were using the, the money to become more educated and were wanting better jobs. And so they couldn't get people to do the menial work. Mm. And I'm wondering about, you know, if somehow it's necessary that we have to keep people um, ignorant. Sure. I don't know about the particular that study. Uh, it's been tried in lots of different places. The biggest, the biggest experiment was done in Finland. And the usual argument is that the robots are going to take all our jobs, and therefore there'll be no jobs left. So unless you want to have catastrophic levels of inequality, you need to give people a citizen's income. There's two issues with that. Number one, there aren't really that many robots. They keep telling us we're all going to be replaced by robots, but... It turns out robots can't tell the difference between a piece of fried chicken and a golden retriever. So, you know, there's a bit of problem there, ultimately. Now, it's going to get better, and they'll make more robots of different programs or whatever. But every time there's been a technological revolution historically, whether it's electricity, electricity, whether it's steam, whether it's the digital revolution from the 1980s, labor markets have gotten bigger, right? There was no such thing as a web designer 20 years ago. Now your kids know all this stuff, right? So we're constantly changing what we do. So the idea that this kind of a fixed amount of work, the robots are going to do it, there's no work to do, we need to do someone else, simply not true. Second one is we're all getting older. There's no robots for elder care. The Japanese tried it and it was terrible. Imagine waking up one day and there's a robot at the side of your bed. I mean, that's, that's, that's not nice. So we need people and we need younger people to work and look after old people because we're lasting longer. And then the third one is, you know this as well from your own experience and we all, we all resonate with this. Work is about so much more than the job. It's where you meet your friends. It's where you meet your partners. It's, it's where you go for drinks with. It's part of the, the social network of everything that you do. And the idea that we need to kind of like take people away from that because we don't need them anymore. I think this is one of those things where the cure could be worse than the disease. Let's go to Nevada at the Friendly House with a question. Um, good morning, sir. Hello again. What's I up? Have, I have a question about, um, I wanted to ask you about Citizens Wealth Fund. Uh, basically, um, the idea is, it doesn't seem like something that couldn't work. It, do, it does seem like that's something that could. It has worked for other people and historically. Um, it seems like something that would be plausible enough for the U.S. And so my question is uh, either what's stopping us or um, if you had a if you had to give us a potentially a roadmap, um, what do you think would be the steps as far as bringing one into the U.S.? Because if it works, you would you would imagine it's not necessarily a novel idea. You would imagine um, we'd be able to adopt it or would have considered it. 
Yeah, I mean, I just think it's partly it's a lack of imagination and partly it's because the financial sector wouldn't like it. The basic idea here is the following. Every time there's a financial crisis, we bail out the banks. And when there's a big crisis, what happens is the value of equities falls about 50%. So stocks get really cheap. The problem is they're so cheap because everybody's trying to sell them all at once. So the prices are falling and nobody has any money right? because they're all trying to get out of it and get into cash, right? Now, at that point in time, what people buy is government debt. Why? Because it's cash-like. It gives you 2%. It doesn't lose value. And ultimately, if this goes up in flames, everybody's dead already. So government bonds then become really expensive and the yield on bonds goes down. In fact, it goes negative. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Treasury could basically decide, or the Fed could decide, or both of them together to decide, that we're going to bail out the banks again. It's going to cost us another two trillion. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to buy all the shares in the banks and everything else that's fallen, and we're going to keep it. We're not going to give it back. And we're going to put it into a giant fidelity-like fund with no politicians anywhere near it, with a citizen's jury board that decides on what we do with it and how it's paid out or whatever. And we just run it as a passive investment firm. You don't try and take controlling stakes and anything like that. You just become Abu Dhabi, basically. And if you did that, basically, with $2 trillion worth of American debt, and you bought half the value of the S&P or the Dow Jones, over 10 years, these things compound at about 6%, you'd pay back the debt that you incurred within about five to seven years. And after that, you'd generate hundreds of billions of dollars a year in income. Now, which you could use for anything. You could use it for healthcare, you could use it for geriatric care, you could use it for any, you can use it for investment and decarbonization, whatever you like. It's literally free money. Now, who would be against this? Banks. Why? Because why would you deal with them if we could do this ourselves? They like the fact that you have to go through them. That's how they make their money. Uh, I found this discussion to be extremely enlightening. It piqued my curiosity on some things. And this is a question I should have known the answer to uh, before I'm seeing this today. But Mark, where can we follow you in terms of, can we take one of your courses online? Do you have a podcast, books? Uh, give us give us ways that we can- uh... I do a couple of podcasts. That's the easiest way to do it. So one is called Mark and Carrie. Mark and Carrie do the news or something like that. Just look up Mark and Carrie on Apple or Stitcher or anything like that. You'll find it there. And it's me and a colleague just basically chatting about the news once a month or once every three weeks. Then at work, I have a podcast called The Road Centre Podcast. They're on The Road Centre for International Finance at Brown. And whenever we bring in a speaker, it's usually because they've got a book. We come, we get them in, they talk about the book, and then we sit down with them and do a podcast on the book. And, and then you'll find out all the sort of stuff we've been talking about and people who know far more than I do and all the rest of it. I've done about... 50 of these so far. So there's loads of them to go back through. So tons and tons of material there. Sounds great. And with that, we will go to the friendly house for a question from Joyce. Nada's question made me wonder, was Andrew Yang right? And what effect would a basic income have on the economy, on the economy as a whole? If you bring a bunch of people out of poverty, what does that do to the entire economy? So the bringing the people at poverty point is absolutely right, but I think that the universal basic income that he proposes is wrong. I mean, this is what I said in response to the last question. The idea that we don't need people, that people are redundant and we need to give them some kind of basic income to live on is just flatly wrong, right? We need more people than ever. The problem we're facing, is, and I'll give you a great example of this, right? Why are rents so expensive, right? Why is it the house prices continue to go up? Because we don't build them anymore. And why don't we build them anymore? You must remember this. If you ever went anywhere near a Home Depot or a Lowe's in 2005, 2006, 2007, what did you find in the car park? 200 guys from Mesoamerica and Mexico waiting to be picked up to work. And they were the people who built all your four-story apartments. They were the ones that did the flashing on the outside of the house. They were the guys that put in the drywall and the plaster. We decided a few years back we don't like immigrants anymore and we haven't had enough kids to replace ourselves. So our population is aging and shrinking. Under those conditions, you need more people doing work. You don't need a, an income to stop people working. Now, what's the best way to get people out of poverty? Give them wages that grow. 
That's it. Just higher wages. All all the returns of the investments in the past 30 years have gone to a tiny fraction of people because we essentially turned it into a financial game. And if you have access to the top end of finance, you make huge amounts of money and it compounds. If you have access to wages and you're in the bottom 80 percent of the wage distribution, things have barely shifted since the 1980s. Mark, this has been fantastic today. Um, you're still on a schedule where you need to leave us in two minutes or so. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been fantastic today. I want to turn it over to our president, Dave Danucci, who has a token of our appreciation um, for your joining us and your help today. Really great. You just got to see this. It's a <laughs> it's a coffee mug. <laughs> fantastic. It has our logo on it. It has the website, which will have a, a video of your answers to our questions on it. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you were a little bit worried that we might not get a good audience today. We got a great audience. Today. Yeah, we got a great audience. Absolutely. Great questions. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it worked out great. Thanks very much. Mark, right. this was fantastic today. Thank you so much for your time and get over COVID quickly, okay? We'll do, my friend. All the best. Thank you. Go humanists. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so we we did our meeting a little bit in reverse today. Uh, we held our meeting to the end because we do have extra time until the end of the program. So let's go ahead and have Al come up with the reading for today. Well, I prepared a reading when I discovered this morning at 0.30 a.m. that we didn't have anybody else signed up. So the reader of last resort, and this was a reading to uh, get you thinking about economics so you would be ready to ask good questions for the presenter today, but this will be a reading to keep you thinking about economics and where the rubber hits the road in economics. It's from a book by Roschino and Donaher called The Voice of Southern Labor, which is a story of what went on as a cultural history of workers in the Southern cotton mills in the 1920s and uh, early 1930s. And it's the, this is just the introduction, just setting the scene, the economic scene where things are going on. And it, it starts with a quote from a, a cotton mill worker. He says, in the village itself, you had recreation. You had the meetings of women, sewing societies, library societies, visiting nurses, and everything somebody would start agitating for oh and every time anyone would start agitating for unions say the first thing mill management would say see what we're doing for you can your union do any more and if you all keep persisting we'll stop this it kept labor divided which made union organizing organizing more difficult it also slowed the con constant wandering around of labor. And so there were mixed motives in all of this. Southern textile manage, manufacturing was rapidly expanding in the 1900s and offered Southern workers their first tastes of industrialization. Indeed, by 1921, Southern cotton producing states accounted for 54% of the nation's total yardage of woven cotton goods. That means real work. And the yield that increased to 67 percent by 1927 partially the result of relocation of textile manufacturing operations from north to south the reasons for the big regional shift were plenty cheap labor was abundant and union activity was virtually non-existent in the south the main folk sites of southern chambers of commerce when attempting to entice northern mill owners indeed wagers in southern mills were approximately one third of those in the North, even after controlling for the cost of living. In addition, Southern workers worked longer hours. That would be 65 hours a week at about 25 to 30 cents an hour. As a consequence of the swell in available mill work throughout, this, throughout the region and in North Carolina and South Carolina in particular, mill owners increased efforts to recruit small farmers, tenant farmers, and mountain populations for their labor. Some of the recruitment was done via word of mouth. Other mills sent recruitment agents into the field and into the mountains. Here's another quote. And we sent, sent in from the, 
and we went in from the farm and a lot of people there that hadn't made anything in those three years, country people, good solid country people went into the mill. They had men that had been in there about since about 1914 or 15. They went back in the mountains and got train loads of people and brought them in there to these new mills. The principal reasons for most migrations and mill work was economic. Individuals with deep ties to the mountains or family history in agriculture, in fact, had an extraordinarily difficult time making the move to what some described as an urban plantation. Moving to the mill was for many a last resort, if not a personal defeat. Well, I just, I just wonder, the, the group that's here, I'd like to hear some comments about my question about what we do for jobs uh, to those people who uh, have been replaced, so to speak, by automation. So what is the answer to this situation? Uh, are the law jobs uh, that we're going to uh, uh, rely on, these low income uh, wages that are supposed to replace the uh, labor high wages that were once in the auto industry and other industries? Where do we go? Yeah, I guess I have an opening thought on that, and I look forward to uh, other comments. But to me, it's almost more about the personality of the of the employee looking for work. And we know that there are introverted employees and there are extroverted, and most people fall somewhere on that spectrum, sometimes in the middle. That sometimes they're introverted, extroverted, um, and to me the introverted employees are going to continue to work in technology and developments of uh, mobile applications and computer applications. And I think that Mark is right that as our society is aging and we need more caregivers, uh, we should find a way to pay our caregivers a higher wage, in my opinion. Uh, and we'll probably need to as, as there's more demand for that service. But your extroverted per people in society, I think, could serve as great caregivers as our society ages. But Helen has a comment there at the mic. When I was a, a kid or um, laborers, uh, the unions, uh, I came from Buffalo, New York. So uh, a laborer, uh, a carpenter, a trained carpenter, a trained electrician, those were honorary, honorable work. And I think there has been a change in our society. And my one of the reasons uh, is just not being uh, promoted. My nephew is a uh, high school teacher and he brought that up to his students. Have you thought about the trades? And they talked about it for, for us. This is in one school. It's one example. I'm not sure if it's everywhere, but this happened in um, Elma, New York, where he talked about joining the trades for a, uh, a bit and before the week was over, he was in the superintendent's office being told, don't ever do that again. Wow. Uh, it was, um, it was a, quite a wealthy uh, area, and the parents did not like the idea of their kids thinking of an alternative for college. Uh, and so that's just one example for me. And also, it's a different work, the work environment now. Uh, my daughter works partly from home. Uh, uh, fr another friend's son, who's a manager, I said uh, many of his people work from home. And uh, I said to Connor, how do you keep track of your people? He said, are they working? You know, to me, is they, they putting in eight hours? Are they doing their eight hours? And uh, he said, I don't care if they do eight hours. He said, I care if the job is done and well done. And I thought that was just a different attitude. So I... I think there's work to be done. I think there's new ways to be educated, not uh, a university that's so expensive. So I think we're in time of transition. I think there'll be work if we can, if, uh, if time during this time, but we're in a time of transition. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, quick comment on, on my end. I have a friend of mine who is the former marketing director for the American Sheet Metal Association. And so she has given a number of presentations different places about the value of skilled trades. And it is a field where you can stay in shape. Uh, you can uh, 
earn as you learn. So you're not going to have uh, college debt. So, uh, and it's something that's always needed. And I think especially at a place like Buffalo, where the weather is more and more extreme, uh, there's going to be more needs for infrastructure. So strange reaction from the school, but I guess somewhat predictable given uh, current politics. Joyce, you had a comment. Uh, I think our speaker also just made a contribution to that question when he pointed out that we don't have the labor supply now to do the kinds of building and those kinds of things that we were doing before. And I'm wondering, you have to straighten me out on this. I can't remember if the Anti-Inflation Act also included the the uh, rebuilding of our infrastructure, the repairs. And yeah, and that seems to me, that's a place that we, need, we can put people to work, especially if it pays enough. And I don't know how the wages are going to be in that, in that act. Sounds good. Uh, Nada has another question uh, on Zoom or question or comment. Um, yeah, I just, um, I wish I'd spoken up when the speaker was here because he, he said something about our workers are going to places like Walmart, um, but the only two Walmarts in Portland just closed. And so there are 500 people without a job. And um, I wish I'd said something to get a comment from him about that. It's like the, the lowest of the lowest are now being um, dismissed. So yeah. just a comment. Yeah. Oh, also, I just found out I'm a distant relative of the Wright brothers. I just had to tell somebody that. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Al is back at the mic. Oh, I've got the answer to Dale's question about what to do about all the people who have been automated out of work. Uh, you have to automate the CEOs. This will do it. This, you know, the, these new um, chatbots that suck up the whole internet and then can carry on a big conversation, uh, they can replace pretty much any CEO. Uh, I, I mean, we ha I had one I was working for down here in Portland and he read one book and he had the whole, co the whole company going crazy trying to do what he read in that book. And, uh, you know, the chatbots could read the whole internet, so they could obviously do his job a lot better than he ever did it. Um, and you, you, as, since the, since the robots don't get paid a big bonus based on current performance, they'll be a lot better than the people who get paid a big bonus based on this quarter's earnings. And there'll be less and less of a hurry to fire people to make the stock go up. And if you just program them right, and you could you could really improve the employment situation for a lot of people if you replace those CEOs with properly programmed computers. Okay. As I go down the chat here, we have a, a question or a comment from G Duns. Can the speaker's address be posted so that we can access it? And that was answered by David Danucci uh, down further in the chat, a couple of uh, couple of spaces down. And remember, you guys can save your chat uh, for resources and links by clicking the three dots in the chat box and then clicking uh, save chat. So let me see. We've got Dakota at the mic. Um, Susan, it's unclear to me um, from what you typed here. Did you have a comment? Did you want to come on? from our Zoom audience and make a comment. For some reason, I'm having all kinds of problems with the chat box. I just wanted to make a comment to uh, relative to the um, issue, including Dell's comments about um, labor and high high paid uh, labor, such as uh, the United Auto Workers. If those were, Typically, at least in in the days, in the heyday, shall I say, those were typically jobs held by men. Jobs held by women, which sometimes require more training, such as caregiving, that was that was uh, also mentioned, are typically women's jobs. Now, all of that is shifting, but those women's jobs are still. Um, those typically women's jobs, women are still paid less than men for the same level of um, uh, responsibility and training. 
And I, I think that's something that needs to change in the whole issue of the economy is is looking at how those jobs are paid so that caregiving is paid for those people who take care of people, which is a job with a lot of responsibility when you think about it. Um, it does not earn as much money as some of the um, other jobs that are more typically held by men. Just, yeah, just saying. Yeah, thank you. I agree with that very strongly. Dakota or Nevada or any other state you would like him to be will, is back I, at the mic for us. I will respond to any of the other 48 just for future reference. Do worry not. Rhode Island less preferably. But uh, it's okay. <laughs> but um, no, so I was, I'm, China is a great example of, uh, of a country using its people, whether for better or worse, using its people efficiently. Um, and I use that word kind of advisedly because they're getting a lot out of people as opposed to perhaps what they're putting in. And so, um, you know, that's as as Mr. Blythe was saying, that's a big uh, that was a big benefit for them historically is they were able to they had a very big workforce who were willing to do these things. And it's worth noting, I bet, and this probably has something to do with, I think, Chinese cultural philosophy is that they didn't really think less of themselves for doing so. Um, and so that's a challenging thing to do in a, in a republic. Um, and I don't know if we'd want to, I'm not trying, I'm saying we should imitate China, China, but I think it's, it's probably worth reflecting on at the very least, um, the cultural uh, effects, whether it's men and women or whether it's um, so philosophies in general, um, this is the word overused, but uh, I think the cultural effects of, of what people of labor itself, like the cultural effects on labor, if someone says, well, this is a job only a woman can do, or this is a job that I get honor from, or this, you know, it's, it's, I don't, I don't think in America, we really, we're just kind of going with the flow. It's, it's really just kind of let to let to be in the wild about what people think about what sort of work they do. Um, no one has had a conversation on that, have they? Or at least outside of tradition, because, you know, not, not many men best breastfeed. So. <laughs> yeah. Plan, uh, workforce planning has its uh, drawbacks and it's uh potential hindrances, but it also has its advantages. So two-sided coin, as they say. Uh, now um, it says in the chat, we have another question from the Friendly House, and I see a gentleman at the mic here. So go ahead, sir. Yeah, I'm Charles. Yeah, one thing that uh, really struck me, and I think the women's issue is, is certainly part of it, but we have a big mismatch between uh, the jobs that get paid and the work that needs to be done. Um, you know, for example, I mean, if you're a coder and you're working on some mobile app that will allow me to like more quickly get, you know, some uh, some French fries from the local restaurant, you know, that you're going to get paid a lot of money, a lot of money. However, if you are a social worker or a nurse or, you know, a, an elder aide or a school teacher or any number of these other things that the society as a whole really needs, desperately needs. I mean, look around here and, and you know, walk around the streets of Portland and tell me how many more uh, drug abuse counselors and, uh, and mental health professionals we need in this country. I mean, you know, and, and the problem is that the, the system that we have now is not distributing things correctly. And, and the only way to solve it, I think, is a government intervention at some level, which, of course, is totally anathema to about 80% of the population. Yeah. But, and I don't know how we solve that one.